Hello, everybody. Hope you all can hear me set up correctly. If it's not, uh, let me know in the comments. Make sure you guys can hear me. But yeah, I wanted to go live real quick. I accidentally forgot to close this. Hold on. No, I need to see my mess. But yeah, I wanted to go live real quick, hang out with you guys for our... Uh, and... Why is it looking so fuzzy, man? Of course, nothing's got to go right. That's a little better. A little better. Smoking, I mean, to uh, start out, let's talk about a few things. I want to get smoking. I got some of this uh, weeds. What do we got here? Focus on it. Not me. Focus on this. Boom. There you go. So that's some crackberry by North Genetics. I also got some popcorn of LAOG here I kind of want to smoke on. I got left of blood orange I think I want to smoke on. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to drink a beer. So, let me pop out this chat and move it over to the other side so I can see it a little easier. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to do an AMA, too, so I'll talk talk to you guys and see what kind of, uh, what kind of questions you got for me. All right. Sorry if I missed any questions so far. I think the first and foremost, we're going to smoke out of the freeze pipe for one very good reason we'll talk about in a minute. Take this out the freezer. I got a little mini fridge with the freezer on it right there. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Nice and simple. Come on, clip. There we go. Good to go. Now, the other cool thing is this is the bowl that the... Oh, move out of my way. This is the bowl that the actual freeze pipe came with. This is another bowl I had that fits the same thing, but uh, if you look at them side by side, it, it. so we're going to use the bigger one. And to start off with, uh, what do you think we should smoke? Should we smoke the LA or should I smoke the Crackberry? Whoever's the first one in the comments to tell me, you're the one that's uh, going to make the call. Hey, shout out from Nine. I remember right, that's the SAC area, in Northern California. Uh, LA. Oh, look at LA. I got two LAs first, then a Crackberry. Bunch of LAs. All right, let's throw throw some bud of the LA in here. LA was first. Yeah, and this is a clone only strain that I got quite a few years ago. This one's actually the Cypress Hill LA OG cut. It's an old school OG cut. And uh, from the early 90s by DJ Muggs and Be Real of Cypress Hill. DJ Muggs kept this cut going for a long, long time. And is uh, and he gave it to someone, third party that I know, in 2002, who then gave it to someone else, who then brought it to the Las Vegas area. It floated around a few different people in the Las Vegas area before getting to my hands. Unfortunately, I was able to actually give the cut back to the people that brought it to the Las Vegas area, even though they had lost it. So, you know, kind of a good story involving. I got weeds. Let's smoke some of this LAOG. So, yeah, either case, this one's for you guys, man. There's somewhere, what, 71,000 of you guys? Something, a whole bunch of you jerks out there. <laughs> I'm just playing, but no, 71,800 subscribers and God knows how many millions of views. You know, I'm glad to have made a lot of videos for you guys. I'm glad a lot of you guys are watching them. And uh, as always, this bong rips for you. Cheers.
Uh, still didn't shave to annoy the wife. Uh, yeah, kind of. I at least trimmed it, though. I trimmed it down. She doesn't like when it gets all poofed out on the sides and starts looking like Santa Claus beard, so. <laughs> Look, Hi Wally says, now if we could just find Girl Mouse. Hey, man, I'm sure Girl Mouse is a busy guy. He's an incredibly smart engineer, incredibly good with LEDs and lighting, and uh, I'm sure whatever project he's working on, he's working very well at it, so. Also, one more forewarning. I don't know how well you guys can hear the music in the background, but that music is YouTube free play music. I downloaded a whole bunch of it a long time ago to put in the background of my videos without having to worry about royalties and rights and all that sort of shit. So these are all free. These are rights needed in playing this music. But just so you know, it is just one big random folder playing. So who knows what kind of music we're going to get. I guess that'll be part of the fun. Cheers. Yeah. Uh, how does that compare with the neck ice pinch? Honestly, like, well, this thing works just as good as putting ice in your bowl. The only thing I don't like about it is how it restricts down to this narrow tube throughout here. It puts a little more restriction on your bong pull as compared to a bong like this, which is just straight tube. And obviously it has the ice catcher in the top. So... I think this is about gone. I might have half a hit left. Let's do it. What can you do with your fan leaves in vegetative stage? What I would recommend doing with excessive fan leaves that you're pruning off or, you know, things I'm assuming you're talking about ones you get pruned off. Um, what I recommend doing is composting them, especially if you have any organic growth styles or any other that beds uh throughout your house like i happen to grow veggies i have a small cactus garden i i like to grow a lot of stuff so i try to compost my leaves if you really want you can actually juice uh cannabis leaves uh from my understanding they're really high in antioxidants and are pretty healthy for you problem is they taste like complete shit they are super super bitter so recipes online for juicing them. That's not something I personally do. I usually just throw them all in a compost bin in my backyard and let them break down. And they eventually get mixed into my veggie garden the next year. So uh, that's what I recommend there. Let me see. Detroit. What's up, Detroit? Uh, juice. Oh, look, and there's someone else answering the same thing. If they're clean enough, you can juice them in smoothies or compost. Yep, same thing. Uh, that's what I would recommend with them, but there's little to no THC percentage at all in them. So, or cannabinoid percentage at all. So it's not really useful to like try to extract them or anything. You're just going to end up with a bunch of crap. You're not going to end up with what you want. So that's something to keep in mind. It's the magical butter machine worth it. I personally have not used it. I know a lot of people that have used it. And they say yes. They say if you want to just set it and forget it, not have to worry about it, it works great. I prefer to, you know, like make my edibles with oil already. As And so if I'm going to infuse butter, I'll infuse butter with like rec. And uh, I find I, you know, that's what I like to make edibles with as flour or trim, like. Yeah, magical butter machine probably make things a lot easier for you, especially if you regularly make edibles for yourself on small scale. You know, obviously I promote home growing. I think home everyone should be home growing if they have the uh, capabilities to and happen to use a lot of cannabis. And uh, if you happen to like edibles on that scale, on that home scale, magical butter machine might make your life a lot easier. So not here to do, you know, advertisements for products, but I've personally heard nothing but good things. Uh, do you think your plants should be let grow in veg, then prune at three weeks and flower? Washington Medical Grower. So 
I mean, it kind of all depends. I, yes, I like to prune. I do a lollipop pruning and a minor canopy pruning, usually a day or two before I flip into flower. And then uh, sometimes a few days into flower, so I will come back and trim it out again if it's really, really thick canopy. And then I usually let it go for about two weeks. Somewhere between the two and two and a half week mark, I usually do go through and do a a little more pruning and that the amount of pruning kind of depends on my growth style and what I'm actually doing. If I'm in a high light, high intensity environment that has CO2 supplementation, I'll strip the shit out of them. Get it back down to very, very small node sites. Make sure you don't rip off any node sites, but get damn near every leaf off of them and leave your canopy really thick. Keep a shorter lollipop and then you can really allow that light penetration to get through and end up with a lot of product low. But in my experience, I don't have any actual scientific data behind this. What I've noticed is that when you're not growing with CO2 supplementation, or if you're growing in a little bit lower light, meaning you're not completely maxed out for your light environment, and you prune too much like that, it seems like the leaves just don't grow back fast enough, and you end up stunning the plant a little bit. At least that's how it feels to me. But if you get it just right, you can still prune about half the leaves out, allow penetration to go most of the way through with a little bit more aggressive lollipop on the bottom and end up with a, you know, a very healthy canopy of high quality bud, even without using CO2. But I don't recommend pruning as much because I feel like you end up stunning the plant more. When you have CO2 and higher light levels, it seems like that foliage grows back faster and you end up with less of a stunning issue. So, uh, what medium am I working with now? Regularly, I like to work with... Lately, I've been using a cocoa organic mix. So I've been using like maybe one third roots organic, two thirds cocoa, and then slightly amending it with uh, some of the roots organic uh, dry amendment products. I've been using the Roots Organic Elemental to add a little bit more calcium in there and, you know, work against that initial cation exchange. You know, buffer extra calcium, and then I usually throw a little bit of uh, Roots Organic Foundation in there as well. And then I start that off, and then I still feed it with a low-dose liquid organics over top at like a 6.5 pH. So that's what I've been liking to do lately. Uh, can you clone without root growth, just soil? Well, clone without root growth, just soil. Well, you can clone a branch into only soil, and as long as you keep the right, uh, you know, root moist moisture and darkness at the callus point, like it should still be able to root over on you. I don't know if I fully understand what you're asking, though. Rob Neck says, weed is a drug. Amen. <laughs> and I'm promoting drugs. Yes. Yes, I'm promoting cannabis. I don't promote all drugs. Definitely promote cannabis. I also promote, uh, you know, personal growth and personal endeavors. And if you're not hurting someone else, you need to mind your own business. Uh <clears throat> I just harvested my buds were really airy. Airy buds can be a few things. One, genetics. Genetically, a lot of sativas and a lot of land races and things just grow airier buds. And sometimes you get a phenotype that leans more on the expression of some of those airier genetics. So, you know, uh, the next thing it could be, it could be... Light is usually the main source of this. If you don't have enough light on the crop, you're not going to end up with enough bud density. There's no way around it. It just doesn't have enough energy to build enough sugars to create enough cells to pack on the density you need. Um, and then, uh, yeah, other than that, mineral deficiencies in mid to late flower. Um, that would definitely do something if you get anything that's going to stunt the plant in like week four, five, six, your yield is going to go down incredibly, whether that's, you know, say missing a feeding or letting your pH slip in a hydro system or 
anything along those lines that can stunt the plant for a couple days, those couple days can literally lose you some percentages of yield. You really need to keep them on peak health, even if you don't, you know, it's hard to adjust in that mid flower. So, uh, let me see, let me scroll up, see what other thoughts on hydroponics. I like hydroponics the hell you see my channel i've ran all sorts of hydroponics in fact when i started this channel and my how to grow series was using pro mix with hydroponic you know our synthetic elf is inert until added you know either organic minerals and bacterias or sort of synthetics and i chose to go with the gh3 part which was synthetic so technically i've been growing hydroponics since the beginning but i understand mean like water culture like aeroponics or dwc and such and i fucking love deep water culture honestly i have a foresight deep water culture in my five by five tent and that thing blows up for me i currently don't have anything running other than my veg i'm in the process of resetting things and i'm gonna get some new plants going soon i actually got some seeds sitting over here next to me i wanted to talk about these ones right here um so yeah those are uh going to be pretty interesting but in that tent, sorry, back to the point, hydroponics, in that tent, I have a foresight deep water on it. Header bucket has a sprayer, a 900 gallon per hour pump in it that sprays up to the top and recirculates water into the top of each reservoir with two inch pipes passively recirculating back to the header. And then I also have a 10th horsepower chiller on it and a six port commercial small size commercial air pump it's not one of the bigger ones it's one of the small ones but uh yeah it works it works really good i actually get my very fastest growth rates out of uh my hydroponic system for sure and uh and uh i get pretty good quality too i think it's a little harder to really get your quality down on the hydro pure hydroponic based systems but i found a little tricks that, a couple little tricks that really helped me one of them is that even if i go completely sterile meaning i'll run like a calcium hypochlorite or a bleach solution with my feed and it'll um literally stay sterilized bleached at the root zone and no bacteria at all even really have just as fast if not faster growth rates than when i really have organics on point first of all secondly when i get near the end of flower and i get in my last three weeks i stop chlorinating i get rid of all that chlorine i get rid of all the water in the reservoir i do a full wash out of the roots i put all new water in the reservoir and then i add a fuck ton of bacteria so that will little things that may help with the processes in building isoprene isoprene being the precursor to all your cannabinoids terpenes and all that stuff and there are some enzymes that can build up area that can help in i believe it's the mep pathways if i remember the research i did right that will speed that up so you actually end up with a more potent product by adding some of these bacteria back in so i'll sterilize most of the way out and then those last three weeks, I'll stop sterilizing and let that go. And if you get the right combination of bacteria in there, you really don't have to worry about the uh, um, root rot setting in either because there's a couple bacteria you can use to really kill down the root rot. thing you got to watch out for is one of them, a uh, product called Actinovate, if, when used in hydroponics, will really foam a lot. So used in very low doses and unsterilized after that point and uh god i can't think of the name of the bacteria that's in it but this stuff's amazing um then also trichodermis make sure you put trichodermis in there and that'll help uh prevent against root rots so uh yeah that's what i do with hydroponics and i love hydroponics those are my thoughts on hydroponics i fucking have a lot of fun with it it's one of my favorite ways to grow um those that know me know i don't look down on any type of grower from the pure organic permacultures all the way up to the you know pure synthetic spraying aeroponics so i think all of it's a fun and interesting way to grow all of it has a really interesting kind of look at it from a chemistry 
uh, standpoint too. Okay, what did I do here? I wasn't paying attention. I was breaking up weed. And I'm pretty sure I was breaking up a bunch of crackberry. And then I just started breaking up LAOG over top of it. Guess I'll have to smoke it. Hey, Dizzy Grower. There's one of my friends. I got all sorts of friends in chat, actually. Shout out to Pedro, Dizzy, Brooklyn, Stallion Mang, Hi Wally. Who else is in here? Polish Hammer, Dr. J. For long enough. X Mount. Man, Tyson Bradley, These Nuggets, Eduardo, These Nuggets, Bingus. What's up, Bingus? Oh, and answer Bingus questions. You know who made that awesome artwork back there? Me and my wife did. I'll let you guess who you think. Which one you think is my wife's? Which one you think is mine? I'll let y'all guess. Is the bright one my wife's? Or is the dim one my wife's? This one's more faded in. It's kind of hard to see. Woo. If I turn way over here, it kind of focuses on it. Hey, man, that's YouTube free music's the jam right here. Have you done any research on DLI, Daily Light Index, Daily Light Integral, or using the Emerson effect to shave off time off your girls running as low as nine hours of light on 15 hours off and flower? I have done a little research on it. It's very, very useful techniquing, especially if you're seeing your plants go from praying to sleeping before your lights really turn off. You can use effects like that to really minimize down your light time, knowing that your plants aren't fully util utilizing the light after it calms down at those last couple hours anyways. Um, I've looked into it, and I think it's an awesome principle and scientific use that principle in commercial grows i would probably do that at home i just like to keep things simple man 12 12 18 6 12 12 sometimes i go 19 uh 5 and veg but you know that's what i do but yes i have looked into it it's great information it's awesome research if you guys don't know what nutrient shout outs is talking about do some google searches on uh specifically daily light integral and uh and research on what is it pfr buildup with 715 nanometer far red spectrum do some research on that and that'll uh really enlighten your day on how you can shave down some of your actual daylight time and minimize the amount of electricity spent without really minimizing your crop at all I don't remember exactly. Where do you rank the Malibu pie? Malibu pie, when I grew it, I got two different phenos, and both phenos were incredibly flavorful. I didn't really get much density out of them, and yield was mediocre because the density was so so. Flavor was good, potency was so so at best between the both. So, I don't know, I would rank Malibu pie mediocre. If you're really looking for something that's flavorful, though, and you're looking for, like, fruit punches and limes and lemons and, and really pronounced flavor and not really worried about your potency, Malibu pie might be a great strain for you. And maybe I only had a couple females, so maybe I didn't have the best of them. I have smoked some of the other Malibu pie from some of the other guys on that team a few years back. And from what I remember, it was really good weed. So don't discredit me. I probably just didn't have the best of phenos, but that's, that was my experience with Malibu pie. Great flavor, not the best potency, and not the best density. I got a fat bowl of, I'm pretty sure, like 80% crack uh, LAOG. Let's smoke it. <clears throat> pretty sure.
That one was my wife's. That one was mine. To answer the question earlier. It is working. I use the flower. See, there's another guy that says he uses a flower initiator light, which is the uh, far red spectrum to initiate putting your plants to sleep faster in layman's terms. But to promote PFR buildup, so you build up more PFR than PR at a, in a quicker rate on your uh, phytochrome. That's the word I was looking for, phytochrome. My, main, my mind couldn't think of it. Uh, hi, Wally. Remember at the end of one of his, you did a dab, a bong, a dab, a pipe. Good God, man, those lungs. Yeah, I uh, I can smoke. I will be very disappointed if I get this corona bullshit and it fuck up my lungs. Because, I mean, I like big bongs. That's part of my enjoyment in life. So, cheers. Bowl's hot. Glass is thin on it. I put my finger right there. Don't do that. Shout out to my bong people, says D's Nugs. Shout out to my bong people. That's a great line right there. Yeah. No, I kind of like it better with a comma, though. Like, shout out to my bong people. Like, you better. <laughs> That's fucking funny. No, actually, I got another story. We got to give this a big oh no hit. Look at what happened here. Look at the base of this. Dangerous. So, about an hour ago, I was cleaning this up, you know, a half hour before the uh, show was going to start here, just so I could have my favorite bong clean for once to smoke with you guys. You see how far I got. I started to get in here and... Bam! Broke that inside my sink. I'm pretty disappointed. I've had this bong like three, four years. It's my favorite flower bong. Thankfully, the chamber itself is still working and functioning. So we're definitely going to take some bong rips with it. But I'm very, very disappointed that I have jagged, sharp bottom that I could now use as a very nice weapon. But... For safety's sake, we'll use the Crown Royal Black Bag and cover the bottom. Because, you know, it would be pretty fucked up if I stabbed myself on camera in front of all you guys live. And y'all just laugh at my misfortune while I try to get to a hospital that's full of corona patients. Not a good idea. This is. <laughs> so let's take a bong rip out of this anyways. How can I? This thing's got ash in it. Is this even clean? Not really. See, I use this is my daily driver. You can tell. Look at this thing. <laughs> oh, man. All right. 
I'm going to carefully put only this uh, crackberry in my bar. Is weed butter hard to make? No. No, it's not. I really don't think making weed butter is hard. Um, depends on how you make it and what starting material you have. It's harder than others. And you have to be able to do a little math. Because, like, say you're starting with really high-grade weed, you got to assume it's about 20% THC. And then assume you're going to get probably, like, 80 90% solubility of, if not more. Some of it's going to stay in that... Uh, uh, cannabis material, so But yeah, it's pretty simple a lot of times if you're using flour Especially you want to make sure your temperatures stay low though, so you don't boil off your THC But put a bunch of butter in a pot get it to a low boil Put your weed in the butter Various different ways to go about this, but Let it cool down so it's not necessarily too hot. It needs to stay well under 300 degrees. And uh, let it sit for a half hour. Depending on temperature, let it sit for a half hour to an hour. And it'll absorb all the oils off your weed. Then put it through a strainer, a fine strainer. And then uh, you can usually put that butter. What I've done a lot of times is you can put it in ice cube trays. And then put that ice cube tray in the freezer and let it solidify back down into butter. Pretty entertaining shit. So, let's get it. I got I got my broken bong. Those that missed the story, you can rewind back. I broke it, so I put a crown royal bag on the bottom because only the base is broke. Cheers for the broken zap. You bastard, you. <coughs> Other bong, which is actually bigger, but this chamber pulls through way faster. You got me. See, that's why I like this fucker. Flower does hurt. It's well worth it, though. Ooh, there's some good smoke. So yeah, back to the can of butter. So a lot of where the math takes place is you got to calculate out, say, 20% of what your high-grade weed is is oil. So if you want one gram of oil, you might need 20 gram or what do you need? One gram of oil, you need, might need five grams of flour of super high-grade wheat. Obviously, like that's gonna, like I said, not as all of it's gonna absorb. So you're gonna need a little more. I'd recommend at least a quarter ounce for a personal batch of brownies if you want to make them stronger, a half ounce, and that's with high-grade wheat. If you have lower-grade wheat, double that. Um, seven to. 14 grams for low to mid strength brownies. And then, uh, and that's if you're only using enough butter for that one batch of brownies. What I usually do is make like a pound of butter and just store the butter and then use the butter later. But I also, a lot of times, do it with coconut oil. Something about it. I think it cooks really well into brownies. So, so yeah, then you uh, have to. Mix that weed into the exact amount of butter you need for your recipe. Be able to boil that down in order to get that single serving. And then you're going to have to straighten it out. And then uh, maybe add a tiny bit more butter to what you got. Because some of it's going to, like I said, it's going to absorb into the weed. 
And uh, yeah, that's one way to do it. And then you'll have your portion of butter and then just go along with your recipe. And except when you cook the brownies again and the final stage of the brownies, try not to cook them too hot. I try to keep them, you know, like 325, something like that. Even if the box says 350, 375, try to keep it at 325 and just go a hair longer. It'll make sure that you don't evaporate out too much of your cannabinoids along with the steam when steam's evaporating from inside the brownie mix. So, yeah, thoughts on making brownies. Especially if you're doing it from flour. Uh, man, that works pretty good. What do I want to smoke now? That was a whole lot of that. Know what I got here? I seen uh, our buddy Dizzy and Pedro were in here earlier. I have like one dab. Of this Nella wafer left that's just been sitting on my desk. Where's it at? In the bottom of there. Can't focus. It's trying to focus on me. Fuck me. There you go. You can see just a little bit of this hash dab from Pedro. Let's smoke that. <clears throat> Since we got some time here. Thirsty too. You're welcome for the damp torch noise. I know y'all appreciate it. Look at my nice dirty rig. This is a big ass rig. I actually got this at uh, I forget which one, probably like the High Times or one one of those at a booth. Dope glass. This has a flower rig. Look what I did. <laughs> it's got a big ass glass bell perk in there. But yeah, it works pretty good. Where's that? All right, there we go. Cheers, y'all. Oh, yeah, that's a winner. So, uh, yeah, nothing makes me happier than smoking single source, pure organic, hash rosin of the finest grade out of a dirty ass dab rig and charred up banger. I don't know what it is, but it just hits me right here. Right here. <laughs> I go for that though. It's great shit. Great rosin. No way around it. <laughs> Taste all the extra carbon, of course. I miss Big Duke every day. He yeah, doesn't even know. He's my man. <laughs> I don't know what the hell this background song is. It's pretty entertaining, though. All right. Anyone else got any questions for me? 
Jimmy crack seeds. What are microbes? Bacteria, fungi, small things. Uh. So, usually when we're sitting in horticulture and we're talking about microbes, we're talking about the bacteria and fungal layers inside the uh, inside the root zone or on the plant itself. You know, they uh, work in conjunction with the plant in positive ways to keep away pests and things like that. And that's what we call our beneficial bacteria, our beneficial fungi, and all the different things that go along with that synergistic relationships. So. Uh, how do you use them in veg? They come in a bottle. Well, there's a few different ways you can apply microbes, man. There's sometimes there's formulas and that are great for just mixing with your soil. So before you transplant, mix it with your soil, put it in there. There's also a lot of your fungal inoculants are like mycorrhizal inoculants. Root zone. So when you do a transplant, you take a small amount of it and sprinkle it in the hole and put that in there. Excuse me. And that works great. And uh, yeah, there's also ones in liquid formulas, like I said, both fungal and bacterial inoculants. And uh, yeah, mind you, I, in my opinion, re-inoculating with bacterial inoculants gives you the greatest effect, but in a strong organic environment like don't rule out that fungi you definitely want a happy healthy fungal environment also so it depends on your growth on your growth style on how important and what type of microbes you're going to want to focus on the most so hope that makes sense yeah, there's also some powder ones like you could just pour on top of your root zone and then water in and it will water in. Or there's some that you can mix with the water and pour right in. So, all depends. There's a lot of different ways to apply uh, and re-inoculate your root zones with my microbial activity. That's what I'm assuming is the long answer of what you're asking in that very basic question of what is microbes. And I'm assuming, like I said, we were referring to horticultural related because, I mean, obviously microbes and bacteria do a lot of things for a lot of different environments and they're involved in many different sciences. Again in the future probably I have a great relationship with gml man like every once in a rare while we get to get a hold of each other and you know bullshit off screen and like me and him always have a positive relationship and always get along great so i'll probably be on there again in the future all depends on the timing obviously with all this quarantine shit going on the people got a lot more time for just hanging at home i might hit him up with him or he'll probably hit me up within the next week or two and ask if i want to be on again he always enjoys having me on and having some of the conversations about cannabis we usually do. Unfortunately, the last episode we were on, it was pretty much all just talking about coronavirus because everyone wanted to know, you know, how different parts of the world are doing as compared to that damn virus. So all I can say on that regard is please stay safe. If you're in a high risk area, definitely quarantine yourself and, uh, you know, try not to pass along any germs. Like, do your best to wash your hands consistently. You're out in public, wear a face mask. Like, things like that really do make a difference. Can really slow things down and and relieve the burden on our health system. So, especially in areas that are hard hit, like New York and Italy and Washington. And, you know, obviously China. You know, my heart goes out to you and I hope it gets better and not worse from here on out. So.
Let's uh, change subject away from that coronavirus shit, though. That shit's not happy. That's not fun to smoke weed, too. Uh, again, tell us about the new light GML is going to send me. Well, he just said he was going to send it to me on the road on the show. I haven't talked to Steven about it or anything. I mean, I have a great relationship with Steven, too, but I don't know a whole lot about it. I just know it's a much bigger light that's supposed to be able to comp- And uh, if so, maybe I'll pull down my 550, throw that up in the very top of my 5x5 five five and see what it does in a tent situation since, you know, it's what we're here for, right? For small spaces and big grows and lots of light and see what the fuck happens. And some more videos for YouTube. Running, I definitely uh, want to get some more video up and running too. So, uh, the blue dream cross with the blueberry terps. That one is no, I, uh, that one's the dreamberry, and uh, I don't have that anymore. That one is pretty good though. It's a great plant. The pheno I had of it was a special cut that Chris Chronic was had pheno hunted, and uh, yeah, it was it was a great plant. There's no way around it. It just stayed really short and squat. Had a really really heavy yield to it, and like you said, it had a, a blueberry. It was like a mixed berry blueberry scent. You know, kind of kind of how a lot of the berry weed is. There's like a sword berry and then it leans one way or the other and this one leaned in a blueberry it was very very nice so very very nice but no i don't i don't have that anymore that that one particularly was a clone only cut but i do have some seed of that in my back seed stock possibly be hidden in that closet could possibly could also be buried in a safe in someone else's backyard and they've been coughing in their backyard all week uh, <laughs> peroxide versus chloride for cleaning depends what you're trying to clean trying to clean coronavirus and chlorides peroxides work on a bacterial basis and you know they'll destroy most bacteria and most fungi and things like that water molds they'll take care of on really high levels but uh chlorines and oxidizers can take care of viruses and things so in you know it all depends on what you're looking for you're trying to kill bacterias and clean out a root zone of a bacterial issue maybe dumping a bunch of peroxide in there resetting the root zone and re-inoculating later is not a bad idea or but uh if you got a viral infection of your roots and you narrowed it down to that which you know most people especially on a home basis it's hard to narrow down if you have a viral infection in your root zone but uh, unless you have other issues already promoting the problem. But say, for instance, for some reason you get some bad soil that's full of a bad virus and you get a viral infection, sometimes the way to fix that is to actually bleach your root zone. Your plants can usually live through it. I honestly don't know what video it is, but there's a video years ago when I was uh, in one of the closets I was in. And I... Uh, Every time I got a male plant, I used to torture the male plants. There's some great videos of me torturing male plants, beating them with shovels and all sorts of crazy. I'm on fire, you know, with blow torches, trying to burn them down. And, uh, yeah, one of them, though, I wanted to take them out. So I started using different chemicals around the house. And that's what I started with was bleach. And I literally poured, like, two cups of bleach into the root zone. No water, no nothing. Plant lived through it just fine. It was sitting the next day praying because it was a little waterlogged the day before. By the time the water evaporated out, the roots recovered a little, even with the bleach in there. Came in the next day, that fucker was playing. Said, well, ain't that a bitch? So I went back and uh, poured like two cups worth of isopropyl alcohol on the root zone. 
wish I had that ISO now. And uh, yeah, either case, that ticket. Alcohol, no good on roots. Bleach can kill viruses and fungi and bacteria on roots. But you got to do a lot to rinse it back out if you want to try to re-inoculate with anything else good. Because it'll also there's also some issues with overdosing the plant with chlorine like that. So, yeah, in the long term, it's not the best. Plants need chlorine on super, super low, minuscule levels. It definitely not the levels in, like, tap water or above. Definitely not the levels in pure bleach poured on the root zone. Oh, uh, Beyond Dreams. Beyond Dreams. Yeah, I still have a cut of Beyond Dreams in there. That one's three-time cup winner, man. I actually got a big mother that's doing, like, mediocre right now. I think I'm going to transplant it even bigger so it can come back a little from the shock and then cut a bunch of clones on it, make sure I get some new rooted ones and set a new mother. So that's what I need to do on Beyond Dreams. And then if I get more you know, healthy ones rooted, then I'll probably run that again for my next round also. But that'll be a few weeks out. Um, I actually wanted to do that transplanting shit either today or tomorrow, and I didn't get it done today, so hopefully tomorrow. Not hopefully, definitely tomorrow. That's a bad attitude about things, so I'll just get shit done tomorrow. Okay, scroll down here. Uh, have Smurfette soon. Had four come up last night. Smurfette is wonderful. I uh, think I got some Smurfette seeds hiding in here somewhere. That's what I'm looking at. Oh, uh, yeah. I knew I'd find them. There's some in them. North Genetics. Look at these North Genetics tins if you guys have never seen them. Pretty cool, huh? I got a bunch of North Genetics. Uh, have you talked about or interested in the importance and difference between par at different stages? Well, see, the thing about par with the cannabis plant is it can absorb so much based on how much chlorophyll it has present at any given time and it can and eat so much eat that chlorophyll can only absorb so much light so that's why there is a light maximum where or par even with a little bit of co2 it's really hard to get any gain when you start getting above that <coughs> excuse me no i don't have corona Thank you. Um, it's all this good, good weed. Uh, so what it, what it really then boils down to is daily light index after your light is under a point that's at a maximum based on the amount of chlorophyll in the leaf, if that makes sense. So... If your plant's really healthy, you have proper nitrogen levels and you have everything else active and ready for photosynthesis and everything's as healthy as possible, you'll have the most amount of chlorophyll present and it'll be the most, it'll, that chlorophyll will be the most active during the day process. It, so much light up to its point, it can still only process for so long during the day. And that's where your daily light in. So most plants genetically have a maximum on how much work they can really do in the day before they really need to go into a night cycle process and kind of light like that. And uh, so, yeah, that's where your light adjustments come in and trying to adjust light to be, you know, at a maximum amount for how long it's going on during the day. And that's one trick a lot of commercial growers use to shave a couple hours off of their flower room, you know, run it down at 10 or 11 hours of light a day because they know they have their lights kind of close in that room and they're running, you know, super intense light at, you know, 12 to 1400 ppm's. Or not 14 p 
PPM, uh, PPFD, sorry. Wrong measurement. Wrong shit. Um, yeah, then they know they can shave like one or two hours off, let it go a little longer night cycle. And one way you can kind of gauge that naturally is if your plant is as, like I said, as healthy as it possibly can. And you go and watch the last hour or two hours of your your day cycle on your plant when the lights are on. And you see that the leaves kind of stop praying and they really drop. That, say, right at the time it's switching. Some plants will do it 10, 15 minutes before. But on like a natural instinct... Goddamn bees on a natural instinct, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know the science behind that as well. But yeah, and as they go to uh as they go to sleep, if they stop praying a few hours beforehand, usually they're kind of done photosynthetically photosynth active for the day for your amount of light level. So you could probably shave an hour off, you know, and let them get a little more sleep in that process and save a little bit on your electricity bill and you're gonna lose very very little if any yield in the process your plant will stay just as healthy in fact sometimes you can get if you're in too high a light levels and that happens it can kind of give you more issues with the light burning and and prolong the problem so that's, you know, just kind of a vis visual cue to look at that I've kind of noticed. Check my mic cord cuts out now and then. Is that working better? Hopefully that's better. Uh, da, da, da. Let me see. How many moles should you shoot for in peak flower? I'm assuming you're thinking like nodes or tops or something. 30 to 40? I'm. It all depends on your area and how much light you have on it, man. It's a lot. Can I get my plants to snap out of a slow spell? Any tips? That's kind of broad, man. It's a little... I can't... I don't know what to tell you there. CCTS. Um, slow spell. Obviously, check your temperatures and that sort of thing. We are in winter right now, so if you're running a little bit cold, their metabolism runs cold, and they won't be able to process nutrients as fast. So... Uh, it definitely makes a difference on them, so definitely check on your environments first. And then if your environments are fine, then go back and check for, you know, root problems, maybe. Um, a lot of times, say if you got a competitive environment, but still a somewhat thriving uh one time it can kind of slow things down if you don't find a way to completely kill it off before you proceed onward and things along that nature all right i'm not gonna lie i kind of hate this one i don't know though it makes me want to rave really makes me want to rave it's weird background music i had to do it oh Need that open though. Yeah, DLIs in moles. Yeah. Daily light intake, daily light integral. Yeah. You understand what I'm talking about though. I think I'm somewhat on the right line, even though you know I'm high and rambling at this point. So yeah. I uh I think it's time to smoke one more time out of one of these big bongs. How about back out of the freeze pipe? We'll go back to the LA. Finish it off strong with the OG. Uh, do you believe that cocoa can be reused? See if I can answer this quick while I'm breaking things up. 
I just yanked the ball, dumped the media in a wet bin, use it inside and reuse two months later. Yeah. It definitely can. The problem you have is after um, when you reuse cocoa, it definitely breaks down finer and finer each time, both from the plants growing through it, bacteria breaking down the organic matter in the cocoa, all sorts of things. So it's not the same medium the second time through. Don't expect the same aeration rates. It's going to be a little more denser and a little more denser each time. But as long as you're not you know, growing any water molds or any dangerous fungi in there or anything, then yes, you can reuse it. What I usually do is break the root balls down with some of my compost or I'll break it down and mix it into my uh, soil bed if I'm redoing my veggie soil bed or something along those lines and kind of let it break down naturally those ways. Uh, but yeah, you definitely can. I wouldn't recommend in personal experience if you're reusing cocoa for indoor growing, though. I would never recommend reusing that same cocoa more than twice. And honestly, if you're going to do it, like, don't be so cheap about it. At least mix some new cocoa in the old cocoa, too. But you, I, if you're going to have organics and other growing methods and things like that around the house, then you might as well just compost the root balls and let the cocoa break down in the compost, and it'll give you a little more organic matter to your compost. Just make sure to add a little more greens, a little more nitrogen-based stuff because of it. Uh, would you try a mega crop in DWC or would something like Jax be more advisable? Honestly, when it comes to synthetic nutrients like that, it really just boils down to minerals they're using within their formulas and then what ratios those have. So I never... When people ask me the difference between, say, this one and this one on a fine level, I, I honestly don't know. Yeah, I would have to look down through their fine ingredients list. I also, there's a lot of ways you can hide ingredients you don't necessarily have to add on the label in a lot of different jurisdictions. So it it's hard to say. All I have to say is it comes down to a balance that makes your plants happy. I recommend trying both. If you can get a hold of small amounts of each, try them out. And whatever one you seem to do better with, obviously it has a better balance for your system, whether that's your hydroponic system or your brand of cocoa or whatever, your system, your environment for your plants. So that's that's what I can say to that. I can say Jax definitely works. In my opinion, it overloads a lot of extra. Run, run the sulfur can be nice in... Uh, it helps with different pathways again to help uh, increase production of oils so but uh, yeah I recommend with Jax make sure you follow at least a minor flush procedure though like don't go the whole life just feeding 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 and really low dose thinking the plant's just eating the right amount so you're okay because your soil system will imbalance really high with sulfur that's from my experience and analysis of it but i've only honestly only grown once with it and i was noticing really high rates like that and my assumption was sulfates i didn't get it tested and then after you know reading the label noticing how it's used to like you are really high in sulfur so but it, with all due respect it grows great weed jacks grows great weed it really does and i've never used mega crop so take take my experience there for what it is um and which really is what my advice for most synthetic grower is do what seems to balance best for you and then do the math to figure out 
you know exactly what's going on in terms of how much your plants are getting you know if you really are trying to fine tune it say on a commercial level that things like that are super important and managing a facility those are the things you the metric you really need to pay attention to so that way you can make sure you're getting the best crop and the best health the best health you get uh, ultimately helps you with pest prevention and you know yield and all sorts of those things you're trying to work for anyways by buying all these nutrients so it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I definitely don't hate Jax. I don't. I just think it's a lot of sulfur. That's the only negative I have, though. It grows great weed, and uh, I got in a long conversation once with Green Gene about this. <laughs> we were going back and forth, and yeah, that was honestly the only negative I had, but you know, a little bit of extra of flushing every two weeks to make sure your, your root zones stay a little more balanced, especially if you're growing in cocoa like I like to do with a lot of synthetic nutrients. This works all right. Shout out to Green Gene, though. He's a, he's a great guy. Much love and much appreciation for him. So, yeah, let's hit this weed, though. I think we got to get out of here. I'm going to smoke uh, this one more fat bowl and get the hell out of here. Sir, I'm trying to look around. No, nothing really else I wanted to talk about. Oh, fuck. There is. Real quick story. Cheers, y'all. I'll try to make the story quick. Very quick, I'm going to tell you right now. <sighs> so, uh, these seeds... Much thanks to the homie Kenny back home in northern Michigan. I had to go back to, uh, home for an unfortunate event to uh, my cousin's funeral. So while I was there, though, not to bring things down, don't even focus on that part. Much love to Cousin Dale. Back to it. While I was there, though, I've been bugging uh, people of mine back home for years and years and years that I want some paralyzer in seed form. There's an uh, old school strain called Pinconning Paralyzer from the northeast part of the lower peninsula of Michigan. Those that are from that area know what I just Pinconning Paralyzer, super couch locky weed that was growing outdoors for years. Eventually, it disappeared because some of the people, from what I heard, this was the story, it got busted. They used to have like a small breeding field in the woods, and then they used to have a big flower field that they would harvest every year and then flood northern Michigan with. And it was great weed. Everyone would always love when the fall came around because there was always good weed in northern Michigan in the fall. And uh, this was all throughout the 90s and then early 2000s, early 90s as a kid. So. Uh, as I got older, though, it stopped because apparently it got busted and they found both those fields and it just stopped dead in its tracks from there. I've heard to this day there's some people that I don't realize are from one of those last few years in the early 2000s, like 2001, 2002-ish, and they still survive and they're somewhere around northern Michigan. They're just hard to get your hands on. And... uh but as the story goes, one of those last couple years, I believe, 
Hilo had another patch, and this is why I know it was one of the light years of Granddaddy Purple Male. No, Granddaddy Purple and Pinconning Paralyzer breeding in a breeder's field off to the side, both from seed. And that didn't get found, rumor has it. My buddy Kenny's dad, Big Ken, was holding on to some of those seeds for years. So these should be 2002 Pinconning Paralyzer Cross GDP. I really, really, really want to grow these. So I think that's what I'm going to do next. And when I get around to it here, which will be pretty soon, I'll probably do make some videos for my channels. That's the plans anyways. But uh, yeah, much love, much appreciation for everyone showing up. If I missed any of your guys' questions in the comments and chat during the live feed here, I truly apologize. Definitely not intentional. But uh, yeah, I'm glad everyone showed up. I'm glad, glad everyone's having a good time. Let's hit the bong one more time. I ain't got enough in here. There's, I can see there's some, but not enough. No, give me weeds. That'll get me through a bong work. So one last time. Cheers for you guys. Make sure you keep growing your own. Make sure you keep enjoying. Cheers.